So, without further ado, yesterday we talked and we opened about being brave and about being bold. And we were very lucky yesterday. We had uh, a brand on stage that is hard to get to speak at these events. Well, not only did we have them yesterday, we've got them today, but we've mixed it up and got someone completely different. And I'm very excited for this first session. It's all around the convergence of media and movies and how it works, how you can make your brand come to life in the, in the movie world, if you like. So to deliver this great presentation, we have Greg Stogden, who is the SVP Creative Media Director over at Burberry. And we also have the award-winning film director, um, Asif Kapadia, who has done two of my favourite films in recent times, Senna and Amy. So he is big time. They are both big time. Let's please welcome them to the stage. Greg and Asif, please come on up. I tend to lead a group of men to the Antarctic, and I'm looking for someone to supply the entire expedition with protective clothing. What is this? It's what you've been looking for. People come to me with their dreams. Betty Dawson is going to attempt the impossible. She plans to break the world record and fly London to Cape Town in 48 hours. And I help bring them to life. Miss Dawson. about your own dreams. My heart shattered apart. This is our life now. Just to bring you up to date of the news of Europe, Great Britain is now at war. British mechanized troops rattle across the frontier into Belgium. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, so that was uh, our festive holiday, whatever you want to call it, film from last Christmas. Uh, if you can imagine, four years ago at Burberry, we, uh, the Christmas campaign consisted of four stills uh, of accessories in an environment. So over the last four years, we've grown hugely with the ambition of what we uh, create around that period. It's obviously a massively important time for us. And each year, we've progressed through a stills campaign to then two films that we made for the previous uh, two years and then we moved on to this which was a huge ambitious project for us uh, 
Essentially, what that did was tell the story of 160 years of Burberry, and we really wanted to find a way of, of doing that. Burberry, essentially, uh, invented by Thomas Burberry, as you saw there, was a, about a piece of cloth called gabardine that allowed people to uh, explore and allowed people to travel to the North Pole, uh, to the South Pole, to fly at extreme uh, cold temperatures. What gabard gabardine essentially did and which is really at the heart of the company, was it allowed people to go further. We, uh, and by doing that previously, pre sorry, previously before that, uh, rubberized was the only waterproof material, so, so it used to create disease and make people sweat. So we had a huge uh, history, and we've never, we consciously never, ever told the story, and we wanted to find a way to do that. So. We, we sat down, uh, Christopher Bailey, who's our chief creative officer and, and CEO, and every year we sit and have a conversation about what we need to do. And we had a great uh, chat about this history and how to bring that to life. It's always quite a, uh, it makes you quite nervous to think about actors and, and that environment uh, when working with fashion. It's kind of a bit of a checkered history uh, in that world, but we thought we would, we would give, give it a go. So we, uh, we sat together, and then I, I actually have known Matt Charmans, a screenwriter, for, for many years, uh, who uh, more recently wrote uh, The Bridge of Spies, Spielberg's film. So I've been watching his career grow and grow, and we called Matt in and had a conversation. And then this is where we got introduced to this incredible gentleman here, uh, as if and as if came in. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, that first meeting. Uh, yeah, so morning, everyone, by the way. Um, so what was really interesting about this process was I, I come from a feature film background. I've made feature documentaries. I've done the old commercial. I've never done anything like this. And it was really interesting to come in to meet with Greg, to meet with Christopher Bailey, the kind of creative director of Burberry, with Matt, a screenwriter, and myself, and to just talk about ideas and to talk about, well, what, what do you want to say? What do you want to do? And actually, you guys had a very clear idea that you wanted to do some sort of period film. You wanted to make, the idea was, the pitch was, let's make a trailer for a film which does not exist. And how do we make it feel as much as possible like a movie trailer, but within it, there'll be all of the Burberry clothes, there'll be the Burberry history and all of these different storylines and narratives. And, but we have to come up with a way of how to create that and how to write that. So it, it came out of a series of conversations and mood boards like this, you know, the history of Burberry was sketched out on a large board in a room. And there were lots of images and visuals and references which we were given. And then Matt and I would look at it and discuss it. And we picked out Shackleton was an obvious storyline. I, as a normal punter, I had no idea. I knew about the Burberry label, I knew about the check, I knew about the coat, but I didn't really understand the history. And I didn't think most of the audience understood. So the idea of somehow getting that history into a film that engages, that emotionally takes you on a journey, that gets you excited. So there's all of these different storylines of kind of life and death and epic adventures and risking your body. All of this somehow is entwined with the history of Burberry, and that's what we wanted to get across. I had no one, I knew about the Shackleton story, but I didn't know that Shackleton was dressed by Thomas Burberry. And you know, I've been to the Arctic, and I've been to quite extreme places on film sets, and the main thing that you hear when you go to the Arctic is there's no such thing as bad, you know, there's no bad weather, there's just bad clothing. If you're wearing the wrong thing, you can die. And the idea that Shackleton that many years ago went and survived because of his intelligence, but also because of what they were wearing, because their tents were created by Burberry. I had no idea about that. So I thought it's really interesting for an audience. It's interesting to know that Burberry sponsored a, a woman pilot who was going to be the first to fly from London to South Africa. So all of these storylines were real. And so that's where maybe the documentary side of knowing the history and knowing what the true story is mixes with the fiction side of how do you tell this to an audience and grab them and get their attention. And particularly for me, getting the attention of maybe younger people who are not interested in certain things, they click on something, see a, see a film online, and they want... My aim was to make something that when people see the trailer, they go, I want to see that movie, when's it coming out? And actually, a lot of people did react in that way. That was the end vision. The idea was, OK, how do we go on this journey together? Um, the first thing was Matt went away, the Matt Sharman, a screenwriter, and wrote a script, a seven-page script with actual scenes and dialogue and characters who went on an emotional journey. 
And we knew we were never going to make a seven-minute film or a ten-minute film. And initially, it was going to be a minute, maybe a minute and a half long. I was always hoping that we could make it longer. If it was good enough, you can kind of find a way to make it a little bit longer. I think it's about three and a half yeah, now. Yeah. But the idea was to write scenes, to create scenes, shoot scenes, and while shooting a scene, say, that's the trailer moment. That's the trailer moment. That little moment there where they're dancing in a ballroom. You have to create the ballroom. You have to dress everyone. You have to get them rehearsing the dance. You get all of the set ready, and then there's one moment when a glitter falls, you think that's probably the shot that will be in the trailer. But you have to shoot a 10-minute scene almost. Or people, We could have shot a feature film, actually. At times, we could have shot a movie, the amount of effort and detail that went into each scene. But you knew you were shooting it for a, a commercial where you were going to get one shot out of it, and that's probably the one that will be in it. As opposed to some, the traditional way of shooting a, a, a movie commercial or something like that would be you just shoot that frame. What we were doing was treating it like a film. You shoot a scene, and you pick the frame out of it, and you're not quite sure what it might be, but you work it out as you're going along. Should we, we talk a little bit about the, the process of how we work together and with the crew and the cast that were, that were assembled, because I think that's a big part of uh, why, we, why we love doing it. And I think from the, from the get-go, uh, being an internal creative team, you become very protective. And I think we've always, over the last 10 years, oh, I've been there 10 years, Christopher obviously been there uh, about 15 years, uh, during that period, we, we were kind of chipping away and discovering the history of this company. So as if mentioned the mood boards there, there's probably 60, 70 stories on that mood board. And we picked three of them uh, for, this, for this story. But over that time, you become quite protective. And I think it was a big uh, moment for me and Christopher to talk around and talk about trusting someone else with your brand. Because the reason I think that we enjoyed it and the reason we think it uh, kind of worked was that we completely trusted the people we were working with. Uh, and there were things that we weren't, uh, ha not weren't happy with, but we were certainly nervous about. It was a very uh, nerve-wracking experience to almost give the keys to the car to someone to tell the story of something that you've been polishing for, for, for 10 years. But it was really key that we, we failed super quickly on, a, on a, some of the early scripts, and we were very honest, and you guys were very honest, and this back and forth was... Uh, part of the, the, the enjoyment. And then these guys went away and started pr uh, proposing uh, a team. Should we talk a bit about the team and the, and the characters? I, I think the trust thing, I, I would like to just follow up on that, because I think that, that, for me, as a filmmaker, is really important. When you're in a situation where you're talking to the kind of creative directors and the people at the top of the chain directly, so if they have a problem with something, they just tell you to your face, and you go, OK, we're fine with that. There were certain elements in the very first script which which you were not happy and we were not happy with. So we went away and we rewrote it, and we worked on it together to come up with a script that we were all happy with, yeah. um, which had to do quite a lot in a short space of time. Then, then we were essentially told, OK, go off and put this together. And at that point, I, I didn't even have a kind of production company, because I do, I do feature films. And on the, every now and again, if I have time, I do a commercial, but I don't really do them full time. So at that point, we, there was not even a production company on board. I then spoke to a few people and brought on Brat, Black Label, and there was a brilliant producer, Dom Freeman, who came on board to produce. And then he brought on his team. And with Dom, we then put a crew together. And we were very lucky, because of it was Burberry, because you know, Matt had worked in feature films and I had worked in feature films, we were able to put together an incredible team who wanted to do this because they liked the idea, they liked the story, they liked the collaboration. We were lucky enough. We had like four Oscar winners on this crew. But it was just one of those things. Sometimes you have to have a lot of luck, but you also have to have an idea that people are interested in. And they wanted to do it. So we had an incredible DOP, Dion Beebe, who, just, who, who won an Oscar for Memoirs of a Geisha, and who just did Beauty and the Beast, which is one of the biggest films of the year. And we had an amazing team. We had a cast who, you know, you can only dream about getting. So Donald Gleason had just come off Star Wars. He was in Ex Machina. He was in Brooklyn. You know, he's been in loads of films. The Revenant, I think, had just come off as well. Never done a commercial before. Was very nervous about it and very honest about being nervous about it, but liked the idea and trusted me. We had a meeting, we had a conversation, and it's like, we're going to treat this like a movie. You're going to be respected as if you're doing film acting. And I think that's what they were nervous yeah, about. Yeah. They, and everything, all of the crew were an interesting mixture of commercials people and feature film people collaborating to make something, which is a hybrid. You know, we were trying to do something different, I guess. A lot of the cast we'd actually worked with previously, and we call it like the Burberry family. They've been in a lot of our campaigns. But working on a, f a fashion campaign was very, very different. Having people actually act was completely out of our our comfort zone, but again, trusting them and them trusting us. 
and see, like, being on set and seeing Dion Beebe, uh, one of the greatest DOPs I've ever, ever had the pleasure of meeting, actually work was, it was also a learning process. So Christopher and myself were literally sitting there watching these guys come, and, uh, come on and off set and touch things. Like the way that he lit the liquid running onto the, onto the, onto the fabric. You, you don't, usually when you're doing a fashion campaign, you're really involved. I mean, we were, we're involved to make things Burberry, like just touch of the hair or the clothes, or uh, we had obviously the design team heavily involved in, in working with the wardrobe. But just the character and making things feel modern, Donal clearly has like an edge to, he, to him, so that was really important to give the whole, the whole creative an edge. But seeing these, this level of talent work on, on a production was a huge learning, uh, even for a, a company the size of Burberry, it was a huge learning curve for us all. I think, I think, yeah, that's, that's kind of covering a lot of the issues. The main thing was it all came back to, for me, as a, as a feature film person, it came back to story and the story of Gabardine, the story of this person who invented this fabric, which was breathable and waterproof, which then was used by certain people that went off to push the limits of what man can do, you know, the extremes, going to the Antarctic, flying a plane longer distance than anyone has ever flown before. All of this was narrative for us. It all was a story that had to come back. So every scene, every shot, even though it is an advert and it's fashion, has to somehow come back to some form of truth and fact. And, and there's a slightly magical element, you know, because we had to work out, well, then what happens? Does Thomas Burberry age? Do we get different actors? Or do we keep him and somehow have him going through time? So there's a slight magical realist element to it. But it was always treated that it was, what's the purpose? What are we trying to say? So every shot, every scene in there is somehow based on some form of truth or fact or research that you've done. Or you, yeah. some, you know, he creates the fabric. And the, the tools on his desk are all based on real things that Thomas Burberry had. If you open the drawer, it had the receipts that would have been in Thomas Burberry's office. Yes. The desks and all of these elements, all of the art direction on set that you see was based on fact. And, and, and so, for me, that's how we would make a movie. I want to be able to turn the camera around and shoot 360 in a location. We were able to do that. Even if we're just looking for one or two shots, we had yeah. the freedom. The actors felt the freedom that if they wanted to walk over to the other side of the room, because that's where they felt their character would be, you could do that. So it was an interesting, like I said, it was a really interesting hybrid that we were trying to push the idea of making an epic commercial for a feature film that doesn't exist. But hopefully, at the end of it, people might want to see it. You know, that so we end. shot over a six-day period, and I think the learnings of how production can be uh, streamlined were, were also huge for us and has impacted all of our, our work going forward. We shot in one location, so everything that you saw there, apart from the, uh, the footage of the, the plane... Was in, the studio, uh, yeah, the, the house. Uh, we, uh, everything was within 150 metres of each other. So seeing how that works, and as, as, as I've just said, going into a, a workshop and opening a drawer and seeing a receipt that's an actual, either it was a real receipt or a, a version of a receipt from that time was, was incredible for us to, to see. And it actually impl has implications on all production going forward for the company now that we, we really think differently. And we, rather than sticking into like, these are our references, this is what we shoot, we open up the, the creative and work with the creatives directly uh, and with the, obviously the internal creative team. And having that trust and freedom is really, uh, was really a, a big learning point. It's interesting what you said about the location. Just another note on that. You know, for me, if you're doing a low-budget feature, the one thing you don't want to do is getting in a car and travel to another location during the day. You want to minimize travel time. So while we were writing the script, you know, Matt was writing it, and we were giving notes, and we were dis discussion about it. I made it very clear to Matt, we have to shoot this all in one location. Now, he's just come off a Steven Spielberg movie, where I'm sure they don't have to worry about how many locations they have. Right? But the idea was if we set it all in one house, all of the interiors, all of the exteriors, you know, the, 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 scene, the battle scenes in the trenches were built just you know, 50 meters away from where the interiors in the ballroom are happening. So all of that was walking distance. So the idea that we don't waste any time, once we're shooting, we were shooting from one, running from one set to another, to another, to another, to get four or five scenes in in a day. And I remember um, the first AD was someone who came from the commercials background. He kept looking at our, sh our script and our storyboard saying, this is impossible, we're never going to do it. Then I'd say, but on movies, we have to do this every day for 11 weeks, you know. This is just normal. We have to get it done. We have to get the moments. This is much more realistic than anything that we've ever done on a film. But for a commercial, because you shoot frames and 
people can sometimes get quite obsessed with getting the exact frame in the storyboard. We were never worried about that. It was like, that's just a hint of what we're going to get. We're going to shoot a scene. That's a good example, actually. That's a train station built by a brilliant designer, John Beard, who's done you know, Scorsese films, and he was the art director on Brazil, the Terry Gilliam film. But he just saw a corner of this house and thought, I can turn that into a train station. We put a bit of smoke over there. We put a road sign there, a car driving in there, get a few people walking out. And you know, I couldn't see it at all, but he just had the vision. So it was picking the right crew is such a key part of it, that, and trusting also, them to do their thing. Yeah, that's also funny, that scene. We walked into the station, uh, myself and Christopher, and we were like, why is it called Oakley? And then I said, John, there'll be a reason. So I went and spoke to John, and we were like, Oakley? He said, yeah, that there's a, a town outside of Basingstoke in the UK where Thomas Burberry lived. There, you, there was a train station there in, in 1900, they closed down in 1905, and, that would have been where he would have met Betty when she came to get fitted out for her flight suit. And so every little detail was, was uh, incredible, incredible to see John, John work. Just want to see. So if anyone has any questions, by the way, please do raise your hand. We've got mics out there. So if anyone has, has any questions, we can carry from, on. Uh, just quickly, from a, a, a creative a marketing perspective, we, we tr really treated it like a film rather than a, a traditional festive campaign. We, we essentially avoided television. But as you can see from the images, there was a huge amount of uh, out of home. Uh, so when you arrive at Heathrow, you really sh would have felt the film. And it drove, I think we had over 20, 21, 22 million views of, of the film. So it drove a huge amount of interest. We obviously had Piccadilly, and then you saw it in Piccadilly, and then... Some Piccadilly Circus was also in Yeah, and yeah. Times Square. Times Square so, for, so for us, putting storytelling content outside was, was, was new rather than it being fashion imagery, but it really it, it worked even in, in, in silent form. Which Just on that, I think, I think the idea of taking something which initially was meant to be you know, a minute long, which I was hoping could be longer, it became three and a half. Uh, it was initially made for online only, I think was yes. my first memory, that ends up being shown on Times Square yeah. and on Piccadilly Circus, you know, just under the Coca-Cola sign. So that was, for me, that was always the aim, is that you, you come in, you have a brief, which is we're going to make this online film, make it as epic as possible, like a trailer. But your, my job as a director is to make however much money we have, push it as far as we can, so it looks like it costs 10 times as much get the best cast you can get, to get the best crew, put all the detail in it, but then hope that it works and somehow it all comes together, that it elevates and goes much further. And you know, there were headlines in all of the biggest trades in the film world, in the advertising world. You open a newspaper that was being mentioned in the newspaper daily about this new movie coming about Burberry. And a lot of the information wasn't necessarily correct, but it was like people were talking about it because it did somehow step out of the realm of being this, you know, an online yeah. film. It became an event, yes. which was like the dream, I suppose. We had something like 99 point something positive comments on YouTube. The whole thing, there was, there was a lot of positive energy around it, and people were getting slightly pissed off that there wasn't a film coming. But well, you know, we'll, we'll see you one day. <laughs> it's also, I have to say, really important. It doesn't always work out like this. We're really happy with the film, but also it was such an enjoyable experience. Yeah. It was like a lot of people working together, collaborating, and having fun while making something that they all felt really proud of. So it doesn't always, it doesn't always work out that way, but it was nice yeah. to have done. Do we have any questions? Anyone raise a hand? Somewhere, one here and one at the back. Oh. Good morning. Morning. I want to see this beautiful piece of art that was, <laughs> I thought that was getting into a movie <laughs> theatre. My question is around um, performance and metrics. I mean, I, I guess you guys had some goals. How did it work and was it worth the investment? Uh, well, like, like I said, first of all, I'm an art director, so I can give you as much information as I can. But we, uh, we Festive is clearly an incredibly important uh, period for Burberry. Uh, as a, as a gifting period, but also you're moving into Lunar New Year on the other side of, of Christmas. So for us around this time, we, it's, we do a huge amount of business. So we, you can, it's kind of abstract measuring something like that. And I think we had a lot of conversations early on, like, do we want more product on it? Like, do we need more check? And I think it was really down to the creators and the... And the uh, uh, as if and Matt and uh, the, the costume people to, to decide how much Burberry is, is, was, was in it. I think the, post the, the launch and, and post that period, we hit all the internal targets that I can't really talk about that we wanted to. So in, from that side, it was a, it was a success. 
but it was also just like an enjoyable uh, thing to do. And it made the company feel quite proud and everyone internally quite proud to see that history that we, we talk about internally uh, come, to, come to life. I think that kind of answered it. I mean, I would say that the, the first conversation was always about, this is about trying to tell the audience about the history of Burberry, which everyone internally, I think, in Burberry knew about. But my, my feeling was people outside didn't. And I think it's achieved that aim. That's the main aim, is that people now understand the connection Burberry has. It's not just an old-fashioned label. It actually started off you know, dressing farmers. It dressed these adventurers. It pushed the limits. It was creating a new technology. And I think now even young people are aware of the history of Burberry. So in that way, I felt like it achieved what we set out to do. As basic as putting the word trench next to trench coat, as, as simple as that seems, we haven't done it previously. We've never, yeah, never you know, we have a that. very deep history with military, not just British military, but global military of dress, dressing uh, uh, armed, uh, 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 different armies from different countries early on in, in the 1900s. We've never talked about it. So just connecting those and for everyone here, the fact that you will now know that Gabard where Gabardine comes from when you see a trench coat, is, it was really the, the main ob objective okay. rather than... An, um, is there another one there? You mentioned that you had to pick three stories from within the, within the mood boards. Can we expect another three next Christmas? Uh, that's a good question. I think you will see different uh, stories come to life in different ways. I think just in, in Terminal 2 in Heathrow, the beginning of this week, week we've launched a huge hot air balloon uh, that tells a story of uh, uh, Captain Maitland, who flew from Crystal Palace to Russia. Uh, so there's, right in the middle of Terminal 2, we, it's, it's quite a unique opportunity. We've built a, yeah, a giant hot air balloon. I think different stories will start to come to life in, in, in different ways. I, I really wanted to get to the swing in 60s, you know, to get all of that, to get all of the kind of fashion and photography and David everything Bailey. Came, musicians and Bailey. And we actually had scenes like that written in the script, but we just didn't get there. It was a bit of too much of a leap from what the rest of the film was, so maybe one day we'll get to do that. <laughs> Another, any other, there's another question here at the front, I think it was. Oh, okay. Anyone else? Okay. Anything else that we haven't covered? Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, hello. I just have a small question. How did you um, continue to leverage the actors, or have you leveraged the actors afterwards? Because they're huge, big actors that could continue influencing the public about the brand, so I'm guessing... Sure. Well, after the launch, we had uh, events all around the world in our, in our flagship stores. Again, we would activate local, local media around those events. So we had uh, Dominic West and Sienna in New York went to the flagship store, and again, we turned up... Actually, that's when we did the, uh, this in Times Square. So we... Uh, Lily, Lily James is obviously the face of our uh, My Burberry fragrance, so... She's continually working with us. Donal was just a complete star of it, in, in my eyes. And the modernity that he brought to it, we will, of course, be working with him more going forward. But I, I think, yeah. So it's, it's, it's key to how we, how we operate as a brand, really. You'll see these characters at our shows and our events and, and, and other pieces of content going forward. With Donal, I mean, it was just interesting having, you know, working with Donal Gleeson, brilliant actor, on the rise, but in terms of reading kind of the comments and the reactions from young women, particularly fans of his from Harry Potter days onwards and Star Wars fans. And then, you know, while we were shooting, my seven-year-old and 10-year-old go, oh, you know, they recognize him from Star Wars. I hadn't seen Star Wars, actually. I'm not a big star. But I was like, who is he in Star Wars? And they were like, they were totally in awe. So it's interesting just having someone like that in the film, how they reach an audience in a different way. By just by being in it, and they connect it. The audience connect them to films and things that they've experienced. Um, so that's just my my kind of reaction to it is that he he was a person that I was really shocked at how yeah. big this kid is and how brilliant he is, um, and, a, and an amazing technical actor. Very nervous about doing anything like this. I have to say, it was one of the conversations I had before, during, and after making this film. He was like, you know, what's it like? I, he was so nervous about seeing it because he was like, I've never done a commercial. I'm not in that place. I don't want to be a sellout. I'm a serious actor. 
And I think that idea of just keeping them comfortable, saying, I'm not going to ask you to do anything you're not comfortable with. Treat it like a movie. We're going to make this like a movie. You're going to be respected as a movie actor. All of the actors were treated like that. And then when we cut it, we're going to cut a movie trailer. Mm. He saw it. He loved it. But he was really nervous. And I think that was interesting because he did not... He wasn't totally comfortable getting into this space, I have to say, particularly coming off the last few years that he had. But um, he's now really happy and really pleased with how it turned out, which makes me happy. I think storytelling makes people relax and makes people feel comfortable. And I think... It did it for the viewer, I hope, with that. And I think no, the actors... They had characters to yeah. play. They had dialogue to actually say. Had it, they had moments to kind of feel something. It wasn't, you know, look, look moody. You know, it's, snack, you know. it's like a snack-sized snack feature. He even said, you know, the, the joke was a scene from Lost in Translation. Yeah. You know, give it with more intensity. You know, and that was his worry. <laughs> it was like, that's going to be. It's just going to look intense all the time. <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, don't make me do that. And it, it, the idea was give him scenes to play and he felt more comfortable. That's his comfort zone. OK. All right. We have one more minute. We have one, one more question, I think. Um, first of all, congratulations on an amazing piece of storytelling. Um, my question is, is that it's, it's wonderful when you have, um, when you can produce a long-form film, which is essentially, in advertising terms, that's what this is. Um, but how, how were you also able to produce that that quality storytelling through other other channels for that campaign. I, I, we were, I won't lie, we were shocked when you cut it down to 15 seconds. The power it still had. We did a slight tease campaign. We treated the whole, like I said, we treated the whole launch like we were launching a movie essentially. So cutting it down to uh, 15, 30 seconds, uh, we, were, we were slightly nervous about it. But I think the the way these guys worked with their editing team was, again, a, a learning experience for us. They give, uh, as if gives, uh, uh, if you mentioned the, the uh, editing yeah, team. Yeah, it's a company called Intermission who do my movie trailers, actually, who I got. So they've never cut a commercial before. So they, were, they cut a trailer for Amy. They, cut, they won loads of awards for Amy. They did a, I'm doing a Maradona film right now. They cut the trailer for Maradona. They've done feature films, and so we got them on and they have an interesting way of working where they have a team of three or four editors who cut each other's work. To, to, they take one little scene and they'll cut frames off and add frames here or there. And so they, that's what they do. So if you want to make a trailer, you get them to cut a trailer. And that, that's how the way we And we work. would do the 15 seconds within banners on... on Which you uh, do on movies all the time as well. So you have a long version of a trailer, you have a minute version, a 30 second, a 15, and they did all of those. And each one, the music track helps a lot. As soon as you hear that song, and you see Donald's face, you've got the attention. So it, it was quite powerful in its short form as well. I think our time is up. Thank you, everybody. I should leave it there. All good? Yeah? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you very much. much. Thanks for getting up. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.